maybe do you want to get rid of the little oh you could well i suppose you can have the video of me but i think it's going to be quite jerky right uh yes okay so hopefully uh we are live now so uh hello everyone um welcome to the latest edition in uh our seminar series quarantine thermo um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Mark Mitchison. I'm a postdoc working for John Gould in Dublin. Uh, I'm actually at home in London right now, so I hope that the British network infrastructure holds up better under pressure than our current political leaders. Um, but the basic format is going to be exactly the same. Um, so we're going to have uh, we're going to have a talk for well, however long Marcus wants to talk, and then we'll have questions uh, moderated at the end by me. So if you think of any questions during the talk, then just feel free to write them in the YouTube chat and I'll pick them up at the end. Um, so, and yeah, so this week we're going to have something a little bit different um, because Marcus is going to um, give us a Blackboard talk. Um, so Marcus Huber, I guess, doesn't really need much introduction. Um, he's an expert in many things, quantum information, quantum thermodynamics. Uh, and many other things he's going to tell us this week uh, about um, uh, measurements um, and cooling. Um, and uh, yeah, take it away, Marcus. Cool. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks a lot for organizing this to you and John and Francesca. It's been a really enjoyable seminar series. I hope my experiment of a Blackboard talk works out. We'll see about that. Okay. So... I was going to talk a little bit about a couple of topics that uh, we were recently investigating. So something that I'd always felt was missing from the theory of thermodynamics, especially a resource theory based approach was an inclusion of a notion of measurement and what kind of resources this actually needs. And this in turn turns out to be closely related to the question of cooling and resources and so on. So, what I'm going to talk about is loosely based upon three papers. The first is Ideal Projective Measurements of Infinite Resource Costs with Nikolai Fries and uh, Jelena Goyanova, uh, where we basically set out to determine like wh what are the minimal requirements for measurement to take place from a thermodynamic point of view. And this leads us inevitably to a bit of an older work by... Uh, a big collaboration that started in Geneva when all of us were still there. There's the first off of Fabien Clivat to the left, Nicolas Brunner and Jonathan Bobras, who is now in um, uh, Denmark, in Copenhagen. Then Geraldine Hack and Ralph Silver, who is now in Zurich. And finally, a recent add-on to that paper about um, improvements from, for cooling through memory effects with... Uh, Another PhD student of mine, Phil Taranto, and uh, current postdoc, Faraj Bakshineshat. Okay, so what is it all about? Let's think about measurement. And also, let's avoid the measurement problem altogether for now, because otherwise there'll be a lot of foundational fights about the correct interpretation of quantum mechanics. And to avoid this, uh, let's just say um, that whatever a measurement apparatus does, a part of it for some time is surely described correctly by quantum mechanics. So what's going on? Let's say there is a quantum state coming along. I'm going to draw this in terms of a circuit diagram. So here I have a system, rho s, and I have another density operator describing my measurement system. And the assumption here is, of course, initially they're not correlated yet. Um, which is a reasonable assumption. You can't quite assume that the measurement apparatus is going to be correlated with all the things you want to measure in the future. So then there will be some physical interaction taking place, um, which will be described by a unitary, depending on what kind of uh, resources you take into account. Is this agent controlled? Is this unitary allowed to change energies? Does it need a perfect clock? Is it like a thermal operation? You can put different things there. But in the end, you will end up with a joint system, or a joint state of system and measurement apparatus. And this joint state 
will have to fulfill certain properties, right? I mean, in order for this measurement probe to measure the system, it will have to be correlated. And that's where the entire idea comes from, right? Because correlations thermodynamically are not for free and not unbounded in the sense you can't just have any type of correlation from a thermal state. So what would you want? What would a measurement fulfill that is a uh, measurement? Like an ideal measurement would be unbiased. That means uh, if I take my measurement basis, I'll just denote it in a computational way. So uh, this is the projector into the i state of my measurement basis. Uh, the projector uh, evaluated on the initial state should better reflect the statistics of some operator that determines the outcomes on the post-measurement apparatus state. I.e., if I read off the statistics of my measurement from a measurement apparatus, I want this to reflect the states of the system accurately. Um, second, maybe not optimally called non-invasive, is the fact that in the measurement basis, the, a quantum measurement, an ideal projective measurement, is non-invasive in the following sense. It means that in the, in the basis I'm measuring in, the probability of getting outcome I before the measurement is essentially uh, equivalent to the probability of getting I post-measurement. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Are these two things enough? Well, kind of, if you add some additional assumptions, but there's an important extra property I'd like to point out, which is that in fact, these are two necessary requirements, but what you really want is the system and the pointer to be really well correlated in the sense that uh, when my system is prepared in state I, I can be kind of sure that the pointer will point to state I. So I can correctly read off the measurement in each individual single shot. We call this faithful, and there are many ways to write this down. I'm just going to write that the post-measurement state should be sum over I, PI, projector on I, tensor, this projector on the, uh, sorry, um, tensor some state rho I of the measurement apparatus, um, plus possibly some off-diagonal elements we don't care about, that is if the initial state of the system is adequately described by sum over I, PI, projector on I, plus also some off-diagonal elements we don't care about because they're not in the basis we're measuring in. Okay, and long story short, like what do we see here? We see that this essentially singles out uh, a very small or very small, a smaller subspace of the entire joint system simply because there is never a term for which there is an I and a J here, i.e. there is never a case ideally where the system was prepared in state I but the measurement apparatus tells you J. That's not what you want from a good measurement. So this means that this state is actually rank deficient. And what you could do is you could compute, for instance, the the average correlation of, of, of your state, which is what we do, J just uh, sum over i trace of i i tensor this pi i I mentioned before of rho s m tilde, where we kind of assume that uh, trace of pi i and rho j is equal to delta i j. So these are kind of projectors onto different distinguishable subspaces. We just take this for the measurement apparatus could be much larger and uh, pointing in direction J could actually be composed of many different microscopic states. All right, so this is kind of a correlation function and clearly this is one for this faithful or perfectly correlated state and otherwise it will be smaller than one. And um, the interesting thing is we can actually a lot of the problems are really hard to solve, but we can try to maximize the correlation given that our state is actually, our pointer starts in a thermal state. It's the only thermodynamically free thing, right? If we want to talk about the cost of a measurement, 
it's really about the cost A of the unitary we will use to affect the measurement. But as we will see, this is not going to be the biggest contributor. The main point is we will be limited by the fact that the only free state is a thermal state. And what we really need to do is to prepare the pointer in an out of equilibrium state that is able to approximate the measurement really well. Now, um, one thing, it's quite interesting, we cannot choose both unbiasedness and non-invasiveness to hold for a general state. Both of them will be impossible to sustain, so we have to choose one. So our choice was, we say, let's take the measurement to be unbiased. This even works with a thermal pointer and then try to maximize this correlation function C under the constraint that unbiasedness should hold. And what is really interesting is this is an optimization problem you can write down the analytical solution for in a very easy fashion. So the maximal correlation of, uh, of, of rho m is equal to a thermal state for all dimensions, for all Hamiltonians, it's, it's, it's always solvable to be the following. It's, it's always going to be sum over i equals zero to the dimension of the machine divided by the dimension of the system minus one of the first Boltzmann factor. So e to the beta ei over z. So this is now the partition function of the pointer itself. Um, so what it just means is this maximum correlation is just equal to the first dm divided by ds eigenvalues. So, for instance, if the pointer in the system have the same dimension, it's just the first eigenvalue. And uh, that is, of course, problematic because it tells us that we need a lot of eigenvalues to be equal to zero in order for the measurement to be perfect. And this essentially means we need an ability to create pure states. So given a thermal pointer, there's just a certain best correlation you can achieve within quantum mechanics, because this now includes the entire unitary orbit, all things that could possibly reach via Schrodinger time evolution, and this is limited. Now, we can do certain things, right? We can just change the pointer system to be have a different Hamiltonian, just to make sure that all of the eigenvalues are concentrated in the first fraction of uh, um, in, the, in the first fraction of eigenvalues, the entire norm is contained, which you would could do by setting the late, later energy gaps absurdly large. This will make the unitary to affect the measurement very expensive, or more commonly, because we can't just arbitrarily shape the Hamiltonians of everything around us, we will need to drive the pointer out of equilibrium. In particular, the best thing is to cool it down because what we really want is we want to concentrate the norm on the first few eigenvalues. So uh, this brings us to the next necessary step, which is cooling. So uh, for cooling, we can again consider a similar circuit diagram. Only here, let's imagine the machine and here another uh, sorry, a measurement apparatus, and here another machine that affects the cooling. Let's call it row F for fridge. Again, without any loss of generality, any Hamiltonian, any spectrum, anything we want. And at some point, that fridge needs to interact with the measurement apparatus in order to cool it down. And this would be kind of a single shot cooling. We have the results on this. But even more interesting, Again, the only free resource would be a thermal bath at some temperature. It's like there is some T environment in which this entire thing takes place. And we're going to essentially look at a sequential protocol of the following sort, where um, the measurement pointer interacts repeatedly with a fridge. That fridge is then reset to the environment temperature and that procedure is repeated until at the very end, um, we end up with a hopefully much colder rho m prime and have used up a lot of steps of cooling in between. Now, the question is like, okay, this, this scenario is super general, right? I mean, we haven't specified the Hamiltonian 
of the of the measurement apparatus of the fridge. These are all arbitrary d-dimensional systems. It's a priori not even clear that an, a reasonable notion of cooling will be possible because these unitaries might change the eigenvalues that it can decrease the entropy, they can decrease the energy, but it's not a given that they will do so in a matter that the new state of the system follows a um, Boltzmannian distribution with some factor beta, right? I mean, it could just be a non-equilibrium, but still colder and lower entropy state. So for that purpose, we just think about a general notion of cooling, um, which is that of majorization. So in the end, uh, what we really want, we want each of these uh, row primes or each of these Let's even give this an index, like this is row infinity after infinity many steps, this is row zero, and then here we have row one. Uh, we want each of the former to majorize the latter, then we can say it's reasonably colder because it would include the notion of actual temperature of any Schurkron K function, such as the entropy, and it would also uh, be colder in terms of energy, and it would also maximize the ground state population, so you can kind of pick your favorite notion of what it means for a d-dimensional quantum system to get colder. So to be more symbolic, so rho i plus one is simply going to be uh, the trace over f of u rho i tensor rho f u dagger, where rho f is essentially re-thermalized into a thermal state all the time. Now, it would seem that this scenario is too crazily general to solve what is the best achievable cooling after infinitely many steps for arbitrary Hamiltonians. But it turns out that it is actually possible to answer this question. We can derive a universal attainable bound on this cooling that was presented in this paper here. And so we can prove it's a, it's a universal bound. We cannot get better, but also we can give a concrete protocol for obtaining it. And what is that bound? Well, it's actually quite quite simple. I can write it down. So the the final machine state, the coldest possible state you could achieve, uh, can simply be written as sum over i e to the minus beta e. I call it e max f i over sum over k e to the minus beta e f max k i i where I assume these are the projectors onto the energy eigenstates of the um, of the pointer state, and E max F is the maximum energy gap that is present within the fridge Hamiltonian. So there's a couple of noteworthy things to be said about this. So first of all, it doesn't at all depend on the detailed spectrum of the pointer. It doesn't matter. The only thing that appears in this pseudo Boltzmannian distribution here is the maximal energy gap within the fridge, and thus the entire precise details of the Hamiltonian of my pointer get completely lost. They don't matter. Just as well, the detailed Hamiltonian of the fridge don't matter. This is basically a universal and attainable bound, but to be fair, in general, the Hamiltonians, the interaction Hamiltonians you would need to write down to actually achieve this are probably pretty hard or in many systems impossible to engineer. However, it gives us still a universal and nice bound to say, okay, we cannot get colder than this. And it's kind of interesting because this is, you see, this is basically um, a distribution that would be you would expect to appear in a harmonic oscillator because in, in essence it's as if each of the energy gaps was now the maximum energy gap of the fridge. And you can see how this drastically cools down the system in the sense that every energy gap is now virtually made super large, which is essentially the same as if uh, the temperature would have been made super low at keeping the energy gaps constant. Um, so this was uh, the second result. We can plug this in here in our first system measurement to show that, well, while it is indeed physically impossible to 
have an ideal protective measurement. This is inhibited by the first law. It's essentially as possible as it is possible to cool down your system to temperature zero. However, you can, in a reasonable similar pa paradigm, cool down the system quite substantially for a reasonable energy cost. Now, the energy cost, unfortunately, ha does not have such a closed formula as here. Uh, that really now depends on the intricate details. Um, of course, the easiest imaginable version of that fridge, just to get an intuition, would be my system, my row M, being a qubit with some energy gap E, and my fridge just being a qubit with a larger energy gap, then here this would be E max F. And, and here, the cooling protocol would simply consist of swapping the two states. Because essentially, all that you're getting is um, you get the top level probability swap to the top level probability here, which by this gap, by virtue of this gap being higher, is now going to be smaller. And the energy you're going to pay is essentially the population. Uh, well, you're going to put this high population here to this really high energy, and that's the energy you're going to pay. And that's really simple to work out. And you can even see a variant of the third law of thermodynamics in this stupid example, because essentially you can never get to temperature zero unless you let Emax go to infinity, in which case you're actually going to swap with an infinite level, which is going to cost you an infinite amount of energy, but get you down to temperature zero. So you can see a bit the energy and cooling trade-off here. Um, what is more? There is actually, you could say, ah, well, why am I only acting here with unitaries, right? I mean, I could extend my unitaries to have also auxiliary systems. And indeed, this is something we also studied, and it gives you exponential improvements. So, like, whoever was going to say this is completely right. I can just, because I'm really bad at drawing, it turns out. We can also imagine the following, where in step one, I interact with two machines, in the next step, I like two fridges. In the next step, I interact with one of the fridges I had interacted with in the past and a new one, and so on and so forth. So instead of reformalizing each one of them uh, at each step, I'm always going to keep one for one unit of time. So it's kind of a non Markovian model with a memory length of one. And by doing this and embedding this again in a Markovian scheme, it essentially turns out this is the same as if the target system was a different one and I'd cool it down to this cold state. And this is, again, excellent because the degeneracies of this tensor product system will be lifted and stretched out to match this maximum energy gap. And by doing this, essentially, I get an exponential improvement in cooling, uh, which is already well known from a different approach, which Essentially, ours is just a d-dimensional generalization of, which is the notion of heat bath algorithmic cooling with scratch qubits. So um, here, I'm essentially just going to enlarge the system to be comprised of a system plus some additional scratch systems. I cool with the same protocol, the system plus and sillas down to as cold as I can get them. And then I do a final unitary and dump all of the entropy of my actual target system into these ancillas and thereby get an exponentially colder system. Um, I believe these are, um, this is essentially, essentially the gist of the three results I briefly wanted to mention because they're all kind of related so we can now plug them all together and produce a lot of plots and curves for energy costs for different Hamiltonians for numbers of qubits. And I feel like there are a lot of interesting discussions to be had and a lot of interesting further work to be done in this direction. So first of all, as I've hinted at here, the cost of cooling that qubit down to zero in that scenario here, well, it's infinity, but I can approximate it well by having really, really large cost. But then you might object and say, wait a second, if I just want to cool a qubit, isn't this thing about lambda erasure, right? I could just cool it for um, a cost of KBT log 2. 
don't need to spend an infinite amount of energy and then I only need to spend a finite amount of energy for the measurement. And in fact, this is kind of true, but it's just hiding the infinite energy in another infinite resource, which depending on your implementation of uh, Lando erasure is probably time. So for instance, what you could imagine, I can slowly adiabatically move up this energy level here, constantly reformalizing it with a thermal bath of the environment. Then, by slowly raising it to infinity, well, almost infinitely slowly, and until I reach infinity, I will have only dissipated a finite amount of heat, and then the um, population will be effectively zero. And then I can just quench it back down, which will cost me nothing, and I will only have spent KBT log 2 to cool that system down to temperature zero, and then I can just swap for free. So, um, but of course, that costs you only a finite amount of energy or work, but it will cost you an infinite amount of time. And now, what we're currently looking at and working out and trying to write up is kind of this intermediate regime, like this trade-off. Okay, so what happens if we have finite time and finite energy? What are the best trade-off relations? Can we again search for some kind of nice universal results that hold for all systems, Hamiltonians and interaction Hamiltonians. And finally, I think the other question that I would like to pursue is how is that really related to what we do, right? Because we've all been in labs or even actively work in labs, some of us. And what is it really that these measurement apparatuses do? And in fact, there is something very similar to the inner workings, which is all the quantum measurement apparatuses that we have, they do take uh, some milliwatts, watts of power even, in order to work or function, simply because I really need to drive my, my, my classical system in a fragile out of equilibrium state, such, such that like a single quantum, like say a single photon, can trigger a cascade and it also means that if I do this in a very high temperature environment, then essentially any random temperature fluctuation of the environment is going to be able to carry, uh, to, to, to affect such a trigger or to trigger such a detection event and thereby affect the dark count, making our whole measurement apparatus imperfect. So maybe it would be interesting to study like I, I see these bounds more in the spirit of lambda bounds for erasure, right? I mean, this is not a bound you can potentially hope to achieve in a complex system. You would require absolute and complete control over the entire unitary. And even if you set the unitary to be energy conserving, as you would do in the resource theory of thermodynamics, it would still mean you having to precisely engineer the correct interaction terms with possibly very intricate uh, interaction coefficients and interaction ranges, turn this interaction on at a very precise moment with a very precise profile and turning it off again at a certain time, which also needs a clock, which were in previous works with Mark and Ralph and uh, Pauli and lots of other people, Nicola, we also showed that also this comes at a thermodynamic cost. So I think the bottom line message is that perfect measurements are impossible and actually getting classical information out of a quantum system so doing a measurement of a quantum system costs you a lot of work and that should always be kept in mind when thinking about say for instance estimating work um, we recently also looked at in a paper about these typical work fluctuations where you try to measure work along a trajectory, along a unitary, so you prepare a system, drive it unitarily, and measure it first, and then measure it again, and to estimate the work of a process. But the interesting thing, in most cases, once you go to quantum systems, the work you spend for affecting these measurements reasonably well exceeds the total work done at the quantum scale by orders of magnitude. So... Um, that is something to be kept in mind, I think, and this is a recent paper I didn't put here now with uh, Thiago Di Barba uh, from Brazil and also Gonzalo Manzano from Trieste. 
And with that, I've been super fast and look forward to a discussion. Great stuff. Thank Thanks you very much, Marcus. Um, so that was great. Um, I forgot to mention at the beginning that Marcus is, I guess everyone's realized that he's in his garden. So that was beautifully uh, given a beautiful backdrop by the, the sound of bird song, <laughs> which is really, really nice. Um, there's going to be probably a bit of a delay as questions come in, um, yeah. but we will, I'm sure, have plenty of questions from the audience. Maybe I can just start off by asking something. You kind of touched on this, but I'm not just just for kind of clarification. So you're um, you're bound on the cost of of measurements. Um, yes. Are you taking into account there the the potential energy cost of actually coupling the kind of measuring device to the system, or is this bound purely a kind of kinematic one? Like it comes about just from the initial state. Do you, do you see what I mean? Like, with, like, uh, does this bound arise from the potential energy cost of actually sort of coupling? So, 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 aha. Do you see you what mean, I mean? Sorry, sorry, sorry. You mean the bound of maximal correlation or indeed. this one here? Indeed, yes. So this bound here um, actually uh, comes about purely from the initial state. So it's purely kinematic in that sense because... What we kind of assumed here is unbounded energy to be present in the unitary. I see. So like, and as we see, like the unitary that is supposed to correlate these two is always a lot cheaper than actually the refrigeration, right? Because in refrigeration, we're going to hit the, the third law and essentially have this kind of exponential scaling as we approach zero temperature, which usually dominates this finite correlation cost. However, um, we didn't investigate, like this bound can only be reached if, if we don't have any restriction on the energy that we can put into the unitary in order to uh, correlate these two. I see, that's very interesting. So typically you would of course also have an energy cost uh, from actually coupling the detector to the system, I would say, right? Um, yeah, yeah, like in our paper, we compute both. We show both in a graph, but we actually had to use an inset to show the correlation cost versus the cooling cost because it's so much, it's significantly smaller. Because in the end, the correlation cost can never exceed the energy scale of the system or, and like of the pointer system plus the uh, system system. <laughs> yeah. Whereas the cooling cost can easily and quickly, by bringing in this external cooling device here, exceed the energy scale of the system by orders of magnitude, which is typically does. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so, we'll just wait a bit to see if any questions come in. Uh, feel free to ask whatever you want, guys. It's just a bit of a delay. Uh, lots of clapping, though. <laughs> <laughs> virtual clapping um, maybe while we wait for another question I can just ask uh, ask another one that I was wondering about I mean so this applies to kind of ideal projective measurements right um, yes or POVMs or anything I see okay so this does uh, this does apply to a general POVM w do you know would you be able to apply this to um, kind of a, a, a continuous weak measurement or... Ah no! Everything we do is kind of discrete. In 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 continuous systems, there are a lot of thermodynamic puzzles, right? Because I mean, even for infinite dimensional, even for harmonic oscillators, uh, a lot of the conventional wisdom breaks down because you effectively have zero population of some energy levels for a harmonic oscillator, right? The point that I was saying here that the first few eigenvalues. Uh, of, of, of my uh, measurement apparatus will be uh, not sum to zero basically implies this is a finite dimensional system because for a harmonic oscillator if I take the first 10,000 eigenvalues or the first eigen however many I take I can always approximate one as closely as I want to right again at a huge energy cost this time because the energy is also unbounded and for um like uh, continuous variable systems with some quadratures, I think it's even harder to tell 
what would be the natural thermal state of such a pointer system? Right, right. Well, you yeah, because this typical, this typical kind of unphysical p eigenstate or momentum eigenstate you'd use for these clocks or for these weak measurement pointers, they're not really thermodynamically free. In fact, like you could even embezzle an infinite amount of cooling out of them. So the question is, to what extent do they really exist? Or like, w what are the kind of operational resources that have to go into preparing them? And I don't really have a good answer for that. Yeah, OK, that's a great answer. But uh, yeah, thanks. Um, OK, so we've got a few questions coming in. So. Um so Prasanna Venkatesh asks, could you please elaborate a bit on the cost of measurements in a two measurement protocol for calculating work statistics? Aha, uh -huh. yes. So, um, well, th the point is here, uh, I'm, I'm just going to briefly, um, I'm, I'm just going to briefly draw a diagram, right? So I initially you, you'd have some system with some Hamiltonian, you drive it along some trajectory with some unitary, and then you end up with, say, another system with another Hamiltonian. And what the typical thing you do is, is this two-point measurement scheme, this TPM, where in the first measurement you do a projective measurement, a perfect ideal projective measurement in energy eigenbasis. So you measure here in EI, EI. And, and then afterwards you measure again in EI prime, EI prime. And you record the uh, statistics. So given the probability that I've observed eigenstate i in the first, what is the probability of getting eigenstate j in the second? And then you can prove that these have all kind of relations, right? I mean, you know that these probability distributions give rise to a quantum version of Chachinsky equality that relates the um, average uh, work done with the free energy change of this out-of-equilibrium system and so on. So there's a lot of cool stuff, but of course, if you then plug in our measurement cost here and here, uh, you immediately see that this is not really easily possible. So here, maybe the best thing would do, I, I said before, we had a choice in choosing whether we wanted our measurements to be either unbiased or non-invasive. So here, of course, uh, one can also consider the choice of, um, of first choosing a non-invasive measurement and then an unbiased one and so on and so forth. So there's actually a lot of variation to this. And furthermore, something I kind of swept under the rug before, again up here, um, you might not want to maximize the correlations, but you might want to rather keep a measurement unbiased or non-invasive and then minimize the invasiveness or biasness. That actually gives you the kind of best results. In fact, you can even recover the exact uh, Chachinsky relation for the work statistics despite your measurements being wrong, which is kind of interesting. In each single shot, your measurements have a finite probability of error, just pointing in the wrong direction. But in the end, once you compute the averages and the statistics, you recover the exact relation you would have expected for an ideal measurement. So that is the good news. So I guess if it's just about these relations you care, you can still do them. However, if um, you care about each individual run of the experiment, then essentially you will make big mistakes. And as you try to suppress them, you will have this exponential cost, like this typical third law behavior of, 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 of preparing your measurement system in order to be able to do a reasonably good measurement. And this cost quickly exceeds the energy scale of your system. So um, it's just to keep in mind that whatever work you're estimating is not going to be useful anymore because you've spent way more in estimating it than you have seen. Right. And actually, I should mention, maybe I can try to orb. Um, I have here, do I have a link? I have a link to the paper. Oh, when did we do this? There. Here. We actually wrote a paper about this um, with Thiago, Gonzalo, Yelena, myself, and Nico, where you can read all the details of this, of the context of work cost in the context of TPMs. Great. Thanks very much for a very comprehensive answer. Um, so, uh, 
Yeah, so we've got another question from uh, Marti Peranau. Hi, Marti. Um, Marti says, Hola, Marcus. Thanks for the nice talk. I was wondering about the third law or cooling and the resources involved. You mentioned complexity as a possible resource, if I remember correctly. I understand how time and energy can be exchanged as resources, but how about complexity? Do you know how ah. you would approach or quantify it? Okay, that's a spoiler alert to my newest paper, which will surely take half a year, but okay. Um, it's, a, it's a great question indeed, because um, I've only told you about energy and time. Um, but there are some results, and maybe they're also interesting in the context of our measurement project, which are, um, think of it this way. Like, I, I've shown you, like, I, I, I've told you roughly this procedure here for Landau's erasure, which is essentially slowly raising the energy gap. By slowly raising the energy gap, I can essentially, um, I can cool for only kT log 2, finite energy but infinite time. But what else could I do? I could also think of it as a finite swap protocol where I consecutively swap, say, with a finite number of systems or even an infinite number of systems with increasing gap. Okay, and I do... First this swap, then this swap, then this swap, then this swap, and so on and so forth. I will end up with lower work costs. So I save on energy, but it'll cost me more time. What if I do this to infinity? Well, I again, I end up with infinite time, but finite energy, and it's another version of, of, of Landau's principle. However, what I can also do is, I, 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 can, I can write down the Hamiltonian, because this is now a product of u1, u2, u3, and so on, until u infinity. I could... In principle, just write down a new u tilde, which is like which is equal to that product, but it is but it is generated by some e to the g h, some new interaction Hamiltonian, and bam, I can like this is a clear example. I can cool to zero temperature and finite time with finite energy. All I need is this h, and so this is my notion of complexity because once you look at it, depending on what system you choose, so like we have all of these results for n qubits or n qubits or harmonic oscillators but what you will need is for instance inter infinite range interaction so we all know like nature or the standard model equips us with very natural bipartite interaction terms most of the tripartite interaction terms we need kind of for autonomous systems we basically generate perturbatively and it's it's kind of hard like people in quantum optics will know all about these nonlinearities and things generating them is is a tough job and it's, it doesn't quite come out natural Generating these infinite range Hamiltonians is physically completely out of the question due to some sense of complexity, which I guess is still the question we're trying to answer. I still don't know like what is the best quantifier. You could say in n qubits you could take interaction range, but then you take a single harmonic oscillator and this breaks down. Um, so... I think we're on the verge of answering this question. We're writing some things up, but um, that's essentially the trade-off I was envisioning. Great, thanks very much. That's really interesting. Um, so we've got a few more questions. I'll just go through them in order. Uh, so Karen uh, asks, Hi Marcus, thanks for the nice and clear presentation. Have you looked at finite size corrections? Uh, E.g. in your infinite chain of coolings, what would be the scaling with a number of iterations? Um, yes, we have in the sense that Ralph and Fabien had looked at it, but I forgot what we found. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not equipped to answer this question right now. It's been a while since I wrote the paper, so if I read up, I could answer, but um, I guess the results we can study it in great paper. detail, sorry. It's in the paper, right? So uh, I guess Karen can find it there. I, I guess even then it's not even studied in great detail. So like the, the exact finite size corrections and trade-offs are interesting. I don't know. Okay, cool. Um, so let me move on to a question from Susanna Welga. Hi, Susanna. Um, she asks, is there a direct relation between the thermodynamical cost of a given measurement and the Fisher information resulting probability distribution? Interesting. Oh, good question. I so the Fisher information. Well, it's the it's a bound on the minimum and like the minimum uncertainty, right? So 
I mean, I guess you need a parametric model. I mean, I, I'm by yeah, yeah, so like, about this stuff. So well, in principle, there's no parameter in what you're what you're doing, right? So I guess yeah, it we we could think about measuring the like. Yeah, I'm guessing one would first think have to think of a framework to correctly kind of map these operational tasks because uh, parameter estimation is a bit more than just doing a projective measurement, right? Right, right, indeed. Yeah. But, but indeed, if you are going to do these suboptimally, I'm guessing this will impact your parameter estimation. And the answer is no, we haven't looked at this at all, but it's certainly interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I would imagine there must be some connection with how much precision you can get in the sense of Fisher information and some energetic cost as well. But um, yeah, I, I'm pretty certain there is, but I have no like, no, never looked at this, never even thought of it. Cool. Well, we can do it in the future then. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's um, let's move on. We've got another question from Nathan Myers. Uh, Thank you for the nice talk, Marcus. Uh, in the context of quantum engines, there is discussion about using shortcuts to adiabaticity to maneuver around the trade-off between power and efficiency. Is there a way to think about a similar type of shortcut for the trade-off between energy, time, and cooling that you mentioned? Aha. Uh -huh. I, I even see it as this, right? I mean, like, sorry, like, I, if I understand the question correctly, I think this is exactly the spirit of the last line I just wrote down, right? Because in the end, you can either do a sequence of uh, of individual measurements, which takes a long time, or you can, uh, sorry, swaps, which takes a long time. You can do a single highly energetic swap, which takes a lot of energy, or you can kind of take a shortcut through this multi-step process by finding a Hamiltonian that gives you a direct path from the all the swapped states, or generates all these swaps simultaneously. So that's kind of a shortcut. We have maybe let's give it one more minute, see if anyone has any more questions. It is a little bit of a delay. Um, we've had quite a few questions already, so I think um, since there's nothing else coming in, then I guess we will conclude this uh, this session of quarantine thermo. Thanks very much, Marcus. Uh, really, really great talk. Um, thanks also for being willing to test out this new technology. It's really great that we now know that not only can we broadcast from a garden, but we can do blackboard talks. So that's awesome. Um, and thanks to everybody for tuning in and participating. And I guess uh, there'll be an announcement soon about our talk on, on Friday. So hopefully see you all on Friday. Perfect. Yeah. Also, thanks to all the audience from my side. Hi to all the friends and colleagues in the community. And well, Hope to see you all in person soon. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot, Marcus. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see you.